Welcome to Thrive, a series that explores how founders, leaders, and changemakers innovate, grow, and navigate in an age of constant disruption. Welcome to Babson, San Francisco. I'm Lynn Santipetro. I'm the director here, but more importantly, I'm an alum, class of 96. Uh, I, I think tonight, more than anything, demonstrates the power of the Babson Network. Um, I feel very uh, privileged to be part of this community in, in a number of ways. And, um, and you know, I think tonight, more than any maybe Babson Connect we've had, demonstrates that. So first of all, we have uh, our speaker, uh, a class of 99. I think a lot of people are here because they know ja Jamie. Uh, he's going to be uh, interviewed by Carol Hacker, who, um, for those of us who were at Babson in the 90s, 2000s, know Carol Hacker as kind of the legendary administrator of Babson, sent, sent many of us um, to probation. <laughs> but we have very fond memories. Um, <laughs> Uh, another Babson alum uh, who graduated last year from our blended learning program here in San Francisco is providing the, the, the videotaping tonight. Uh, Randall Usury is, our, is the CEO of um, Free Range and he's our partner on the Thrive series for those of you who've been to that. And they're going to be videotaping tonight and that's going to be featured. Jamie's going to be featured on, on that series on our site. So um, make sure to check that out. Uh, we have gr amazing staff here who flew all the way um, out here to be here for this event. We have our dean from the grad school. So thank you all for being here. Tons of students and alums. Who here is an alum? Awesome. Student. Nice. Un both undergrads and grads. So anyway, um, thrilled to have you here. I am going to introduce our program. It's uh, my honor to welcome our guests tonight. Um, the first, Jamie Simonoff, is the founder and chief inventor of Ring. He graduated from Babson undergraduate in 1999, where he was a budding entrepreneur already, starting his first business while in school. Um, that was called Your First Step International. Uh, several companies and two acquisitions later, he founded his current venture, Ring, the world's first battery-operated smart doorbell, which you saw nicely demonstrated there, um, with the mission of reducing crime in communities. After failing to convince the sharks, famously failing to convince the sharks on Shark Tank to fund his company, uh, Ring took off. Since then, he's grown the company to 1,000 team members, raising an impressive $209 million, $109 million in the last round, and has caught the eye of investors such as Richard Branson. Jamie considers himself an inventor rather than an entrepreneur. Um, someone who conceives of new products that solve problems. In 2016, he was inducted into the Alumni Hall of Fame at Babson uh, as a rising star. Um, we're thrilled to hear about his journey as an entrepreneur and inventor. And so first, let's welcome Jamie. And joining Jamie in the discussion is Carol Hacker, the Director of Centennial Campaign <laughs> Engagement and Giving. Carol has led a distinguished career at Babson, starting in residence life, becoming chief student affairs officer where she first met Jamie. I think <laughs> there might be a story in that somewhere. I'll be telling uh, you. can choose to tell it or not as you choose. Um, uh, and then chief of staff, <laughs> and finally as head of Babson's Alumni and Friends Network. She came all the way from South Carolina where she left at 6 a.m. this morning to join us here tonight. And so, welcome Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm always thrilled to be able to uh, come to an event and not necessarily interview, but facilitate a conversation with an alum, um, and particularly an alum I knew as a student. I think for those of us that work at the college, um, we see you at 19 or maybe 22 years old if you're starting the grad program, and we wonder what your future is going to be like. And sometimes what happens at the college is, is a good indication in the case of Jamie, he was an entrepreneur as a student. Um, and in some cases, we see people be develop their entrepreneurial life uh, when they're 40s and 50s. Um, this is an easy example of someone who came to Babson with already uh, a vision in mind and then stuck to it. So when I think about Jamie and I think about him being an inventor, um, I also think of him as an entrepreneur. He may not think of that as much. I am here really just to facilitate the conversation 
really to make sure Jamie doesn't go way, way off topic, um, and make sure that we have time for your questions and answers. So Jamie and I have kind of done this shtick a few times um, over the years, and so. The first uh, time was when she kicked me off of campus for having a keg in my I room. I did. <laughs> And since then, we've worked it up. It's like, we have worked it's like it the up. prison warden with the it was. It is. escapee. With my, my favorite convict. Um, I'm wearing stripes for that reason tonight. And as I say, in fairness, I let Jamie back on. So let's, let's be fair about that. And I could say the same for others in the room. Just saying. Um, so one of the things I thought we would try to do tonight is talk a little bit about Jamie's early entrepreneurial ventures and his, and his quest to be an inventor. Um, have him build up to Ring and talk a little bit about that, um, how that happened. In there, he'll talk a little bit about, of course, Shark Tank and that magnificent opportunity, as well as we'll talk about what's next for Ring. And then I really want to make sure we save some time for all of you to ask some questions. So I'm going to let Jamie tell the story of him being a chief inventor and how that all happened, a little bit about his Babson background and then lead right into Ring and what you're doing today. Sure. So the inventor versus the entrepreneur thing, um, I always called myself an entrepreneur early on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Babson, School of Entrepreneurship. Being an inventor is not, not it's, it's not trying not to be an entrepreneur. I just realized that as I got deeper into business that really what I was good at was the, the sort of the mission, the looking forward, the, the invention of and solving of the problems and not really building the actual business itself. The business, you need to have a business to impact, as an inventor, like if you wanna make an impact, you have to have a big business. So having the business is like sort of a, a, a means to an end, but it's not, so I kind of realized over time that it's more of an inventor than an entrepreneur. So that's where that kind of comes from, which as a Babson crew, I feel like that's worth the explanation. But, um, you, but you do operate as a CEO as well. Yeah, to me the CEO though is not, the CEO role is about the mission, it's about driving the mission and the future of the company. So like 20 years out, like that's, that's what I think is, uh, I believe that's what a good CEO does. And if you look at I think some of the best, I think that's really what their talent is. It's not about operating the company. No. Um, and you know, I've had to operate businesses, especially when we were small, we didn't always have a, a large team. Um, but as the team has grown, I've definitely you know, had, I, I try to give a lot of autonomy to our team and have people that are better at running things. Um, Do that. Yeah. Talk about that first business at Babson, that Muller Prize winning Actually, so there's a, business. Actually, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a business before that. So I had a, my first business at Babson was called Gadgetronics. Oh. Gadgets and electronics together. It's catchy, catchy name. No, it's terrible. <laughs> um, I had some really bad names. I mean, I, I, luckily I, I, finished, I finished strong, but um, uh, so Gadgetronics, I sold electronics on the campus. Uh, one of the girls who went to school with us, Renit Levy, yeah. um, also a 99, um, from Texas. Her dad had an electronics store, so I'd buy the electronics from her dad at cost and then sell them on the campus. So made decent money doing that. Split half of it with Renit, who did nothing for the business. <laughs> um, laziest, worst business partner of all time. <laughs> and we made like, I mean, we made like $50,000 or something, which but again, back then was probably like 500 million. Well, these guys are in school. Like, they know. Um, so I did that, and then I start, and then I won the Mueller Prize, which is, you know, to me, it was the Super Bowl of Babson, uh, which is now it's now called something else. It's a, it is called uh, Beta, the Babson Entrepreneurial uh, Entrepreneurial so, Thought and Action. Yeah, so it was, but it was the business plan competition. So I won that on a, like this self storage business or whatever. But yes. what that did is it led me into doing business plans for people which that led me into going to international places because that's where I got some clients from, which got me into the telecom business. Um, and I started doing voice over IP with another alum, Thomas Noble, and uh, Saad, is Saad here? Yeah, I saw him in the back. Oh, there you are, <laughs> with this guy. Uh, and so there's actually a bunch of us, Micah, I mean, there's a, uh, Micaiah, I mean, Mi I have a Micah now, it's Micaiah was the one there. Um, how many, was there any other Babson? Oh, there's one we won't, one Babson person, if not off the topic. Um, <laughs> But, uh, I'll tell you their name later. Yes. So we started doing, uh, so we started doing uh, voice over IP. I started doing voice over IP. I started building these networks in all these international countries. Fun story, which brings into Branson. Um, I was in coming back from Congo and going to Tunisia. And the only way to do that was to fly through Brussels. Um, I was 23 or 4, I think. Okay. Um, I looked like I was 10. <laughs> and um, and so um, I get to the airport in Brussels. This is kind of pre 
Wi-Fi, hotel yeah. internet. So I had been in Congo, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, so I did not have internet at all. So I get there to like check some emails and do some stuff in the hotel that's at the airport. I missed my flight to Tunisia okay. because I got late. So I go to the hotel airport, the airport hotel. I'm in there, I'm like, I had like two beers, I'm in the business center doing stuff. I wasn't hammered, but I was certainly a little buzzed. And uh, so I go in the elevator, I'm like tired, and I'm a little buzzed, and guy walks in, he's like, floor, whatever. I'm like, what floor? And he says, and he says, you're American. And I said, yes. And I look up and I said, you look like Richard Branson. And he said, I, I am Richard Branson. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was like, ah, uh, you know, like, like, oh my, oh my. I mean, like a Babson kid, you know, trying to be an entrepreneur, you know, Richard Branson. Right, yeah. So he's like, what are you doing in Brussels? And uh, I said, um, yeah, I just came back from the Congo. And now, like, I didn't realize, like, Richard Branson, like, his, like, like if you want to talk to him ever, mention anything in Africa that you, if you know something in that, don't just mention <laughs> Africa. I mean, like, don't just, like, I've don't heard just, of Africa, doesn't Like, just don't throw it out there. Like, that's not, like, that's not gonna, but, like, you know, and he's like, the, the Con you know, he's just like, the Congo. And so I end up talking for like a half an hour outside the, like, in the Brussels Hilton Hyatt, whatever, airport hotel, in like the, eighth floor lobby of the elevator. Um, and he's like, please get me your information, because I had nothing on me. And he's like, I I'd love to talk to you. And I'm like, Ugh. so I write this like, it was like, um, who's the Unabomber guy? Like, I feel like it was like the it's Unabomber. Like, like this yeah. was like, a t like, I'm like all like nice letters. Like it took me like, <laughs> took me all night. Like, you know, I'm like writing this thing out to Richard Branson. Like, you know, this like, and um, I check out of the hotel in the morning. I have an early flight. I give it to the, you know, I go to the lobby or whatever, and I said, like, can you give this to Mr. Branson? And the guy's like, he's not, there's no Branson here. I'm like, I, I know. So I'm in the elevator last night, he said to pass on the information. So like, whoever is like not here, can you? Like, <laughs> guy wouldn't take the envelope. And so I ended up going, and it was one of those things where it was like the door that would never, you know, it was like one of those like, yeah. Just crushing Wonder. moments, and and you know back then it's like actually harder to contact people. Like it wasn't like the twitters and right. like these things to like just kind of reach out, and people were a little bit less accessible. So and I went back to kind of work and forgot about it. So we'll get and then Richard ended up fast investing. Fast forward, yeah, fast forward. He's a, became a big investor in Ring, and I actually spend now quite a bit of time with him, and it's like it's amazing. And so so but. then talk to us about Doorbot, <coughs> the first name. Yeah. Um, talk to us about Ring. Talk to us about Shark Tank. So yeah. So let me. I, so let me. Okay. Get so it. so so then I do. Uh, I did a company called Phone Tag, which is a, a voicemail to text. It was a, a okay business. We sold it for a little bit of money, but not like nothing great. Um, I did the, did a company called Unsubscribe.com. Right. Great product, terrible business. Um, and then I went into my garage. I was like, I'm just gonna. I'm like, I got totally. tired of doing this like constant sort of wheel of these like little shitty companies. And I said, like, I'm going to just invent. Like, I'm an inventor. I'm going to invent. I'm going to go in the garage. And I had all these different crazy things. Um, one of the people was my best friend in college, Leah Israel, yeah. her, who's now Dylan. Leah Dillon. Uh, her husband, Mark, was one of my partners in that and still a partner in the thing. Um, and so um, I just started, like, literally inventing. And I had a gardening thing, I, all this crazy stuff that would never work. I couldn't hear the doorbell <laughs> in the garage. And so I just built a Wi-Fi doorbell because why would you not? Um, you why, would your, why would your doorbell not go to your phone? Was my like like didn't make any sense. <laughs> and that became my wife then said this is the best thing you've ever done, which I really thought was a little bit rude. But like, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's like the one You're thing. Still I, married, it's though, like the yeah yeah that's true. Well, that's just because I travel. We're married. But, <laughs> but it's like the one thing I wasn't working on, and she's like, that's really great. Thanks. So um, always trust your wife. And so, um, good lesson. so, so it ended up becoming kind of the product. It started out as Doorbot, uh, which was a, a, it was a, it was like three of us building this thing. We had no idea what we were doing. We had no cash to do it. We just scraped along. The business should have died multiple times. It took us about four, almost four years from really starting it to getting it to a point where it could be like to start to actually go. Product, right. um, but it was really, it was a, the most brutal, like, I mean, happy to talk if anyone's quite like, but it was like disgustingly brutal. Like it was. Well, how do you survive that? How do you survive four years of, is this going to happen? When do you cut it loose? What, what was your decision process during that four years to stick with it? I mean, I, I think I'm just, I, I just, I'm too persistent. Like I'm just persistent. Like I just, I just can't give up. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I guess that's a good quality looking back now, but I mean, there's, I had investors that said, you have to stop doing this. Like you can't like, 
like you guys have no idea what you're doing. Like you, you like kind of have to stop. I mean, it was not, those are investors. Like, yeah. That was so it was it was it was rough. I mean, those are rough rough days. I mean, it was like and there was just no, like there was no light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. I mean, looking back, it's like you can see these clear progression lines. Like when you're in it, you don't know what tomorrow's like. You don't know that you're gonna have a great development tomorrow. That you're gonna figure something out or what's happening. And so it was it was really brutal. Shark Tank saved us because we got on Shark Tank. The money, the credibility and awareness that came from it, we didn't raise money. I actually did really want to raise money on it. I've had, now everyone's like, oh, good you didn't take the deal on Shark Tank. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> we were so broke, like, yeah. like I was dying. Like, are you kidding me? Like, didn't take the, I would have taken any money on Shark Tank. <laughs> I mean, the things I would have done for money back then. I mean, it's like, so I, you know, so, Shark, but Shark Tank and gave us this. that was early on in Shark Tank, too. This was, in this was, it like, was early on. We were asking for a lot of money. It was like a whole, but. It was like probably the biggest amount of money they had been asked second for. Second biggest think, ask at the time we yeah. did it. So it was a, and the first biggest ask, which is crazy, was, was the first, the largest deal ever done was $2 million. I, now I think it may be bigger, but at the time it was $2 million. It was the one that taped before me. It doesn't air right. in my, like, because they, they move them all around, but literally what taped right before me. So when I wa like, walked on the set, everyone is, like that, like everyone's like, holy crap. We just spent a lot of money. And they can't tell you anything. So they're just like, oh no, just go on. It's been an amazing day. I'm like, <laughs> For like, someone else. <laughs> yeah, and so then I'm like, uh, $700,000. You see the face is like, oh, like, you know, like we just did 2 million. Um, so I think that was a part of it. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Mark Cuban couldn't see it becoming worth more than $80 million at the top. Um, his investment, I think, would have been worth now, oh God, I think it'd be almost worth 80 million. So anyway. So, um, yeah, but Shark Tank really did, it saved us. I mean, it was, it was, that was, if it wasn't for that, I think we would have actually died. We would have. Um, but it gave us the money to sort of limp to the next thing and got us just a little bit, like, it was literally like an like a injection of, like, like adrenaline. It, it just gave us this, like, jump above where we were to then fly at a different level, and then we were able to raise a little bit of money on top of that, and then we just kind of, like, limped along, but at, like, kind of a higher level. Um, Doorbot, we then rebuilt everything, which was Ring. Ring launched September 29th of 2014. Um, and really from, if you look back, I mean, it's still, I mean, even like today was a hard day. Like, you know, it's like there, there's, it doesn't get easier. I think it's maybe the, the stress is different. But if you look from then, like the line is pretty, pretty straight up and to the right. Yeah, your trajectory from, from that moment there to what your product line is today um, it seems to me you keep inventing. Yeah. So you, you've taken the product, it was a doorbell that rang on your phone, helped prevent crime yep. to what it is today, um, and what is it going to be tomorrow? So we, you know, we've always had this mission of reducing crime in neighborhoods. We actually had that early on. Yep. And that was, that was part of what brought the team through. You know, I, I say a mission is, like, is, is cheating in a business. If you can have a good mission that, and you really, you have to believe in it because it's not, if people don't believe in it, it doesn't matter. It's just words on a wall. But if you really believe in a mission, like we really believe we could reduce crime in neighborhoods, it's amazing like what that can do and how you can like rally a team and like right. how you can get behind that. I mean, money is the worst motivator ever. Like no one has ever been truly motivated by money. You need money and it's a good scorecard and a great thing to have, but it doesn't truly motivate anyone from what I've seen. Um, and so, so we had this, this mission of reducing crime in neighborhoods. We've always been looking at these like three rings of security, the idea of like looking sort of 20 years out and building for that. So we've built the, the ring of security around your front door, which is the most important one because that's where crime starts. The ring of security around your home, mm -hmm. which is things like our floodlight cam, which you saw, which we just launched, our stick up camera. And then the ring of security around your neighborhood, which is how we take all the data and crunch it together. Um, today, ADT sued me for my next product, which I wouldn't announce yet if it hadn't been for them suing me. <laughs> Um, it's a big day for Jamie. It's a yeah. big day. It actually is a big day. I mean, like, you know, like. Not every like, day a big company sues you like that. Though. Yeah, I mean, they care. Like, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, like, and, and, and the funny thing is they, they waited a little too long to sue me. They should have sued me, like, last year when I was weak. But now, like. Now bring it on. Bring it on. So, so this is going to be interesting. They, they, they sued us for, uh, basically, they, we took over a company that they let go. Mm -hmm. And they, they didn't think that anyone would take it over. Um, it was in Pennsylvania. Yep, so. um, we found out, it's actually a Babson grad was there and working with me. Um, and then we found out that it was on a Wednesday night that the, the company had been shut down. And Thursday morning, I was there and hired all 80 employees. Um, 
That didn't go over very well with them. Mm. Nothing illegal, so it'll be fun to let it play out. Frivolous lawsuits are, are corporate America's uh, defense. <laughs> but um, so that was today. So, so kind of getting more into the <laughs> datas and sensors and things like that. Yeah. So, Talk about your network. Talk about who's helped you. Uh, everything from your Babson friends in the back there to uh, someone like Richard Branson. Um, and how has the Babson network, you know, talking to everyone in the room, how can it help them? I mean, Babson's a, uh, Babson is a pretty strong network. I mean, I, I, it's funny, I, I was trying to think of all the, it's like, the, I've actually used, I mean, we've had a ton of Babson stuff, especially early on in my career. Right. I think, I mean, Babson's so strong in terms of, there's so many, mid-sized businesses that are owned by Babson people. And there's a lot of people that run great companies from Babson. And so we've used a lot of stuff from that. Um, you know, so like our first deal at Staples, so Pete Gertzberger, right. who is married to another Babson grad, Courtney, what's her, Baker was her maiden name. Um, so I go to Staples, it's our first account, and he's like, oh, I went to Babson. My, you know, my wife went to Babson. I, I knew Courtney from Babson, I didn't know Pete. He was younger, yeah. And uh, yeah, he was younger. He, Good for Pete. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, I, so, I, so, you know, Staples, and we got that. And so there was, you know, that was a great thing. And then we ended up becoming friends and, and staying together. And then he ended up working with us. And, and now he's on the team. And then we took this company over together. So it's been, uh, yeah, Babson's, Babson's been great. Um, you know, building a business network is, you know, is something that I, you know, a lot of people always ask, like, how do you do this? How do you, like, it's taken me, you know, I, I mean, I've been out of, school now for almost like 18, 18 years, years coming up, yeah. yeah 18 years so it, it took a long time like I, I, I didn't really make it I mean I, I, I had I mean I had some slight medium successes but like nothing, nothing great and and if I look like a lot of the stuff at ring was due to like these long like just long-term things that kind of paid off in the end I mean a lot of the people that work with me at ring have worked with me now in different companies forever I mean right. um, you know our our landlord's son in San Diego is still one of my like best engineers. We knew him when he was like the, the kid was in high school. Um, I think you know so so some of just you know some businesses just pop and some young people can go out and like literally just pop businesses and do amazing. You know for for me it's taken me just a longer time to build all the stuff needed to to really do that. So talk about Richard Branson, your relationship with him, and then talk about how you've taken the company and your marketing strategy because I think a lot of people are saying. Yeah, I've got an idea, or I know how to finance it, but who's going to help me market it? And you've kind of done all of that. Yeah, I mean, we are definitely, we are a marketing company. So yeah. we, are, we are certainly technology, but we are very heavy in marketing. I mean, we produce in-house. We have video production. I mean, we are a content company. We produce a ton of content. We do all of our own commercials. This year, we'll probably spend 60 to 100 million on TV um, nationally. Um, so we, I mean, we Just are. Just on QVC. On QVC last, I was on QVC last week, and I did a 24 hour. They did these like today's special value. I sold 6.2 million dollars worth in 24 hours, which was 39,000 units. Which that was that was pretty fun. That's another big day. That's another. Um, big day. But you know, but but it, it's in, like, but the success of that came because we had people calling in that had the product for years, right. and we had a 92, like, one of the. I mean, like this 92 year old woman. I should send her a check. <laughs> she calls in and she's like, I'm 92 years old. I installed it. You can do it. I love it. It makes me feel, you know, it makes me feel safer in my home. You're a genius. I could see my, like, I could see my wife at home being like, oh no, like, oh no, like this is gonna end, you know. But like, literally, you're watching. You can like watch the sales there as yeah. things are going. And I mean, the, like, we're kind of going well. And then she comes on, and it's just like, <laughs> like, I mean, it's like every other 92 year old woman is bought. But that, ha but th but she was happy because she like we made a good product yeah. or a great product. We had great, we have great customer service good support. Um, and good support. So it's like all the like all the work culminates into these things. Like those are the results. Right. But it's there's so much work that goes into uh, building those things. I mean, even Branson, like, you know, I met him in the elevator that one time. He remembered it. Um, I knew people that kind of knew him. Then he heard about the products. When he contacted me, there was a little bit of, like, you know, that. But that took, you know, there's just, like, luck in a long time. Um, and then having a great mission, and he was excited about that. And then, you know, after he invested, it's been nice. We've, like, I've been now with my family twice to his island. Um, 
the best story, I mean, because it's just like, it's just the most ridiculous thing. I actually, like, so we're on his island the first time. I bring my son, my eight-year-old, who's seven then or whatever. Um, and it's like, I mean, it's, it's like, the, it is the most amazing thing ever. Like, it's, it's better than you can even imagine. Like, <laughs> like, like don't, like, whatever you're thinking it is, if you haven't been there, it's better. Like, it's just, it just is. Like, it really, it really is, like, nuts. And so you know, we spend all this time, and we're spending time with, like, him, and it's just, like, it's, it's like, fan it's fantasy. And so fantasy then we're supposed to leave, and he's like, listen, the people who are coming next, they're not coming. If you want to stay a couple extra days, I, like, okay, you know. <laughs> So, we, so then now we're there alone. So it's just like my family and the Bransons, you know, and, uh, and like 100 staff. And so we, we stay there for that. And then I'm packing up to go. And it's like, it's a lot of flights to get back. It's not the easiest place to get to, which, but it's worth it. And so this, the, the guy comes down. And he's like, uh, when I'm packing, he's like, listen, um, Richard's actually going back to Los Angeles tonight if you want to go with him. And I'm like trying to be like somewhat respectful, like, go with him? Like, <laughs> And he's like, yeah, on his, on his plane. I'm like, um, OK. Uh, like sh I shouldn't say no to this, right? Like, it's not like a, like, is this like a test? So we ended up then flying back with Richard and his on wife his on his plane. plane. And they are like, they're like the best, like, it's like your friend's parents. It's like being with your friend's parents. Like, all they're worried about is, like, is Oliver eating enough? Yeah. I'm like, uh, yeah, he's fine. <laughs> like, like the, the third bowl of pasta that you made him, yeah, like, he's OK, you know? Yeah. like. What movie do you guys want to watch? Yeah. I'm like, whatever, Mr. Branson. It's like, it, Richard, it's your plane. Yeah. Like, oh no, you're our guest. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was like one of the. And I, so I'm walking on the plane, and it's like my son, my wife, they're behind us, and I just said to her, I'm like, if I wake up and this is a dream, I, just, I I'm gonna be so pissed. <laughs> like, I am gonna be like, this one's gonna hurt. Like, this, this one's really like, because it was hurt. just like, this isn't real. Like, this is, this doesn't happen. That is so cool. It was, that is it was ridiculous. Um, before we open up to questions, because I know there'll be a ton, talk to me a little bit about, yeah, obviously it's, it's a great mission um, with the company, but I also know you have personal missions, and you're, you're a guy who gives back to the community. Yep. Um, talk to us about how do you fit all of that into this life of yours, um, and how important is it to you? So, yeah, I mean, ch so charity is a big part of our company and sort of my personal life. So in the company, we call it Full Circle. Um, we gave a million dollars last year to schools. We did another million this year. We're doing a million to neighborhoods. Um, we're actually sponsoring um, prison reform programs now because it's, it's like I look at it as like one half of the circle is catching people, which is we catch and convict almost one person a day right now. Um, the problem is when you put them in jail, like we're just pushing, you know, just like it, it doesn't really do anything. They're going to come back out and they can't get jobs then, which is even worse. So no one, no one will hire someone like that. So what are they going to do? They're going to rob your house. And so we're kind of trying to do the thing called first full circle now, which is the other side, which is like how do you reform people and, and get them back. That's in the company. My personal life, my son, uh, you know, like Boston has been an important part for us. Yep. He was born with a genetic uh, issue. Um, Children's Hospital Boston specializes in it. And so we've uh, given a, like a pretty, raised a pretty substantial amount of money so far. I think over half a million at this point. I ran the Boston Marathon last week. Was it last week? Two, Two weeks, weeks ago. ago. Two weeks ago. Um, and he did very well, too, by the way. I saw him at mile 14. 14. 14. I, 14, you look great. He looked great. <laughs> no, like 14, you're I like. I took a picture of him. I put him yeah, on my yeah, Facebook no. page. It was great. No, I, I, I literally, great. I even looked at the picture. I'm like, I looked great then. <laughs> at mile right, 20, at me. mile 20. Yeah, not so good, huh? I, I like, in my head, because you are you got all sorts of stuff going on. I'm like, take a picture of yourself and email it to you, at me, like, this is what I'm thinking, and say, never do this again. <laughs> So that you remember it. Now, luckily, I didn't do that, so I'll do it again. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, I didn't win the Boston Marathon, but I did win for Boston Children's. They have about 150 runners, and I raised more money than anyone else, which was, that was like my, my goal. So I raised 70 grand for them. So that's cool. Cool. Um, last last thing. Talk a little bit about expansion um, and in terms of locations and doing this around the world. You heard the British accents in the yeah. uh, video, so you're obviously selling all over. But you're also uh, providing offices and employment all over the world too. Yeah, so we become. I mean, it's become a very global company. We've been opportunistic with different sort of things. We had this company in, in Pennsylvania that we took over. That was 80 people. That's wow. just yes. uh, like 40 minutes west of Philadelphia. So we have an office there. Uh, we have three offices in Phoenix for our customer service. Uh, our main headquarters is in Santa Monica, down in Los Angeles. Uh, we have a pretty big office for some tech stuff in Kiev, in the Ukraine. Um, Buenos Aires, Argentina. One of my founding partners was in Buenos Aires and just happened to be a guy we worked with. 
cool. Um, and he ended, and so I ended up just kind of like naturally just kind of kept hiring friends there, and then it just became bigger and bigger. Um, we have about 100 people in Taiwan, uh, in Taipei, and so we have, and we have some people in China uh, for the manufacturing side. Uh, we have an office in the UK and Netherlands for, for sales. So it's, it's a... It's everywhere. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's the, I'll tell you the weirdest thing is like showing up to these places. It's just like, it's, it's kind of like, how does this all exist? Like, it's just nuts. Um, you know, so I, and I still kind of build it like it's my, like in Santa Monica, if you come to our office in Santa Monica, they are like the crappiest offices you've ever seen. <laughs> um, all the international offices, because they're like new and like yeah. we have, like, I guess like you have to, I don't know, like, because we're not, so it's like they're nice. And so they're like these amazing offices, but yeah, like Santa our, Monica's your garage. it is just like plastic tables. I work on a file cabinet. Like it is just a disaster. Yeah. And I kind of really, that's like comforting to yeah. me, so. Well, Jamie installs, I don't know if you've seen some of the videos, but I've seen him do some installation on homes and, and we may see yeah. some more of that this week. And my email address is on every single box. There you go. So. And he responds too, which is yeah. really, really good. You threaten him and even better. Um, Galima and Lynn are, have microphones, and we do need you to wait for the microphone because of the taping. So if you have a question for Jamie, we'd love to hear it. He would love to hear it. He may not answer it, but he'd love to hear it. He would love to hear the question. In the back. It's always in the back, Lynn. You should wear flats. Hi. Thank you, Jamie. This, is, this has been great. You mentioned your wife's role in the beginning of the company and some lean times. How did you get through that? Are there strategies of folks who are doing entrepreneurship and supporting young families that you might be able to sure. give us some advice? So I was really lucky. I mean, so one is, I mean, having a great spouse. Uh, I have a great wife, so, but like, but like in terms of like just your, having a supportive spouse is so important to this because, and, and really family, like even having your kids be supportive of it. It really is a brutal journey. And so like when you're, facing sudden death, like if your family's not supporting you, that, that certainly hurts. I'm, I'm very fortunate my wife works and, and is successful, and so she was able to sort of carry the torch on that side. Um, because we did get to like, looking back, like I don't know what we were thinking. Like, we took this, like we, we came way too close to the sun, like we flew way too close to it. Uh, I don't know how we didn't burn ourselves up, but. Yeah. Like, she had benefits, which helped, right? Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, so I mean, I, that was, really helpful and and again her being supportive all the way through has been hugely helpful um carol and i talking even with my son like i whenever he's out of school i travel with him um so going and like i now have to go which is again a, it's kind of a strange thing like, i have to go like see all the offices and like you know it's like it's like kind of like these it's just i don't know it's weird to like be the person that's doing that but no it's like as soon as he's out of school this year i'll go around the world with him to every office um, which I'd have to do anyway, but I'll bring him. So we'll do like 14 days and, and that's, and you know, he's eight. Um, he's been doing it when he was five. We went to the factory and took the first door bot off the, off the line. So that was really cool in China. So it's, he's been kind of doing it with me the whole time. And so it's kind of, I guess we're kind of growing up. It's almost a little bit like family business-esque. So, but support is, is definitely needed. And I think there's no good answer though, in terms of like, like for some reason, and I don't know why, maybe I was just like, in shock. I never was scared about that stuff. Like I'm more scared thinking about it now, like in looking back. Yeah. When I was in it, for some reason, I just, I, I don't know what it was. Maybe I was so close to death that I knew I just had to focus all my energy <laughs> on like life and I couldn't even have the like attention on it. But looking back, like I, I seriously, like, I don't know how we, I mean, we drained bank accounts this year. I mean, it was, it was, it was a really close one. Um, and that's like, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yes, in the back. If you could stand too, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Jamie. Um, you talked a little bit around your persistence in terms of those four years, as well as talked about the mission of the company. I'm wondering what was more important in those four years for you? Was it the mission of the company and how in terms of like your persistence around the idea or your persistence in your character in terms of really helping you see you through those four years? Um, Interesting question. Uh, I think, I mean, the mission made it feel like it was worth it to be persistent. I think they're too intertangled to pull them apart. Like, I, I, I think if it didn't have the mission, I don't think I would have stayed as persistent on it because it did feel like there was something else. Like there was like, we just had to, like we had to see if this thing could stop crime. Like, it, like literally like just everyone in the company had the same thing. Like we have to stop some like one criminal. Like we just have to do it. And um, 
and, and so I, 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 think it, I think it helped to be persistent, because at some point you do give up. I mean, it, it, it is, you know, it is impossibly hard. Um, I think most people in this situation, and again, a lot of venture capitalists that are part of this now and stuff are like, that people are definitely surprised that we kept going who, who were on the inside during the, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jamie. Um, I was curious because, you know, lots of us has business backgrounds. You studied at Babson and you consider yourself an inventor. Did you have any engineering background? Um, and I think it also inspires us who just have a business background. My co-founder and I, we created a robotic coffee vending machine and none of us had, you know, engineering background. We just hired good people, right, that yep. believe in our vision. I was wondering how you did it. Were you, did you have any technical knowledge? So it, I, I'm a self taught engineer on a lot of things. Um, one is I just, as a kid growing up, I literally spent every waking moment I could in the garage. And actually, it, 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 I had this little like sort of room in the basement where I used to build stuff, including some bombs, and like, I'm glad. I, it all worked out, it all worked out. Um, I, you, you tinker, you know? Um, so I did learn a lot of stuff just doing that. Um, when I got into the voice over IP business at first, um, my partner in it had some issues and basically like left with the money in the company and I was left with this voice over IP business that that I know I didn't know anything with like what to do with it and at that point I had no software engineering background I had no software engineering I didn't really even understand it and so I had this literally I had this network that I owned and that I couldn't operate and so I, I was in New York City and I remember just being like what the hell do you do and I literally went across the street to Barnes and Nobles and got the Cisco book of voice over IP, which is like this, I mean, it is like, I, like this. And I started reading the thing and I taught myself how to program those Cisco routers. And that was what opened me up into just going in, in from, the, from the software side. Um, and it just like blew my mind. And that, that was really one of, the, one of the best things that ever happened to me was being forced to learn that. Uh, John and I were just talking, he took a semester off from Babson right now to do uh, program. He's doing like a like a hack. What, I don't know what you call it. Like a. He works in the building next to us. Okay, so he works in the building next to you. I want to hire him. But I think I mean, <laughs> I think learning like the the blend of business and understanding the skills and being able to even be like I don't think you have to be like a full computer science engineer or mechanical engineer, but really being able to do that yeah. stuff is super important. I, I you know with Doraba, I used to go to China every three weeks. I was in all the design for manufacturer meetings with all the contract manufacturers. I picked up more stuff because I think when you know where you want to go with something, you're better at it than any engineer is going to be at finding the nuances and the little pieces. And so, you know, having that sort of a little bit of that background and doing it, I think it is so important. So I love like blending the two together, I think is just super valuable. Um, and then obviously trying to hire people to make up for the areas that you don't know. The problem with that is when you're you know, when you're broke and you're trying to start a business, it's very hard to like hire. And, and engineers are the hardest people to hire initially anyway. So like if you can do some stuff yourself to get things going, then you can attract the talent in, so. Thank you. Hey Jamie, nice to meet you. Hey. My name is Mitchell. I'm actually also in the same program with John here. Excellent. Um, current student. And uh, actually Sebastian kind of took uh, one of the questions I was gonna ask, but. For us, like current students and sort of young alumni who are, you know, looking to start businesses or currently starting it, I think we're really interested in like the very early stages, you know, like even before incorporation. Um, so I'm just curious about like, like you talk about your background, but what about the background of your co-founders? You know, when did you decide to incorporate? You know, how was that in the very early stage before even like the, you know, the trudge and like the years where you were trying to, you know, get customers and so on? So I mean, really I started, so if you look back, like I started basically a consulting company and that's what led me into business. Um, I think. It, that's not a terrible, I never give advice by the way, so there's no like, like please like don't, like there's a million ways to do stuff and there's lots of people that are richer than I am that would tell you to do it differently, so. Um, but I think, you know, I started a consulting business because it brought cash in, because I, I literally needed money. What was great about that is it got me into business, it got me into like the flow of things and I was making money, that then when I saw an opportunity I was able to kind of get into that. Um, and so I think, I mean, I don't know how you start a business like just from like just from scratch because it is so hard, um, and that's also the magic. Which is like, how did we build this consumer electronics company? Like, if you look back mathematically, 
there's no freaking way what we did worked. Like it just, it just didn't work. We had to get on Shark Tank. That's how it worked. So 30,000 people applied for Shark Tank the year I was on. You needed to get one of the 80 slots to make it work. So that, that's my recommendation. You know, get a, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But like, it's like, it's, 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 you know, luck is such a big part of it also. So I think when you're starting out, I mean, the, I, the only thing I can say is it's not about like, you know, what's the steps or incorporating all these things. I think it's like find something you're passionate about and somehow if you're lucky, like those things will, will take you through. And I think it's also be long term, uh, feel long term or focused around the long term. You know, I think too often it's, I'm going to start this thing and we're going to be like, we're going to be rich, we're going to do this. Like, and like, I mean, I just, you know, and it's, that can happen. And I hope it does happen to you. Or it never happened to me. I hope it happens to anyone. But like, and I, and I think if, you, if you're like, you know what, by the time I'm 50, maybe this company will be decent. And you seem you look like you're not 50. Um, then you know I think it, it it just makes it that it's something you're gonna do, um, and I think that's what entrepreneurship, invention, starting companies it should be something that you want to do because you want to do it. Again, if you want to make money, I have to tell you, starting a business is the stupidest thing to do if you want to make money. Go into banking, like like just go into it. Be a hedge fund, private equity, trader. I'll give you like I mean every rich person I know is one of those. Like, <laughs> so it is the worst way to make money. So do not go into this for money. Now, if you make money out of it, and you'd be like, great. But it is really a terrible way to make money. Jimmy, while they're getting another question, talk a little bit about what you said to me earlier about the green light, red light. Like, when do you stop? Are you going to continue yeah. this? So what every, happens? Yeah, so every business is, I think every business is very different. So there's lots of, I mean, it, it really, so again, that's why I think advice is so bad is that, there's so many nuances to not only business, but also time. So time's another factor that people always forget to look at, which is like they hear your story of your business and they're like, I'm going to do that. But time is different when you start or when you do anything else, and time changes all the variables. So, so from that side, I think every business is different. I think this current business we're in is a winner takes all business. It's, I was saying red light, green light in terms of we either grow insanely fast and become the largest security company in the world by the end of next year, or we die. Like, I don't think there's a middle ground for us. So people are always like, well, you know, when you slow down a little bit. And the problem is, I just don't think we can. Um, now, I think there's other businesses that you can build. You know, I know super successful a Babson grad in LA who owns the Krispy Kremes. Right. Made a phenomenal amount of money owning the Krispy Kremes of Southern California. Does awesome. Not stressed out about growing as fast as he can, you know, like, and, and so totally different. And I think that that's, each business has its own nuances. I do think the business we're in is, is red light, green light. It's, we either grow this thing, we either go 1,000 miles an hour or we're dead. I, I, think, I think Alberto Perlman would tell you the same thing at Zumba. Yeah. Right, so the yep. year before uh, Jamie, same thing. Had to keep growing, had to yep. develop a product line to go with the classes, had to do the videos, had to, had to keep growing it or it would yep. die. It'd just become another exercise path. Uh, this is amazing, Jamie. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to ask you, so you said you started a consulting company. And uh, so uh, before going on Shark Tank, when you were kind of focusing on consulting just to raise some cash as well as focusing on the product. So when you're riding these two boats, how do you kind of decide your focus or how do you kind of focus on one thing while leaving the other around? And meaning so how did you it, do so that? It was, in, it was the consulting thing was when I was in college, when I just had gotten out, I'd won the Mueller Prize. It was during the dot-com boom. People wanted business plans. I happen to be a horrible business plan writer, and so I was able to sell lots of business plans. Um, it was just an amazing time. I mean, and like winning the Mueller Prize gave me this like credibility that I could write a business plan, which I couldn't. Um, and so I did business plans for these other companies. It got me into like the flow of things happening. I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do okay. long term, so it really never like it, it never took over kind of what I was doing. It was just a way to get. But I do think if if you're trying to get if you want to, if you feel like you want to be in your own business or want to do that, I do think there's something about just getting into the flow of things, like not waiting for the exact moment and not, you know, planning every last bit. Because again, time is changing while you're planning. Yeah. So people sit and they plan their company for like two years and they have these business plans and like, but time is evolving and everything is changing as that's happening. So the quicker you can get into like that flow, the better than that because. Then you're going to keep making. I mean, everything changes all the time. I mean, ring changes every day. Like it, it, I, I say, it's like we're like a snake. We molt our skin. 
Like every two months, we're completely different. Um, and, and, and like something that, you know, a, a team member will come and say, I'm doing this. I'm like, no, do this this way. And it's like, but we, that's how we do it, you know, two months ago. I'm like, yep, we now change. I mean, and, and, that's, but that's, and that's evolving. And I think any business, whatever size you're at, you have, that's what happens. And you have to change evolve the, for and change for the environment. So thank you. Thanks so much, Jamie. Ooh. Um, I was just curious, you briefly touched on um, your future growth, um, but I, <clears throat> from the sound of it, you guys have, I mean, I, you know, I can tell you guys have grown rapidly over the past three years. I'm curious what the um, biggest challenge you faced to, um, to date in terms of the growth and like how you, um, you know, approached it and what you would have done differently. Sure. So the biggest, I'd say the biggest challenge is in the last 18 months, I think we went from like 75 to 1,000 team members. That is, I, I, it, it just like literally just physically that's hard. Like putting people in a place is a lot of work yeah. for like going to that, that fast of growth. Um, the, the mission is amazing because it keeps every, like it's so hard to bring in new people and have them all focus on the same thing. And, and focus is what makes the company powerful. If everyone's going in different directions, the company loses all its power and it's like just kind of blows back. If everyone's focused in like in, and super in this like tight formation, you shoot ahead. So the mission is great because you can just get everyone around this one mission. Um, that's been really important. Uh, having, for us, what's been, what's been great is that I have attracted a group of, I call them CEOs in our company. So we have like 40 CEOs that run their areas. And so we're very autonomous. So it's a little bit like the military. I've actually spent some time with some of the Navy SEALs. It's actually how the military now runs with the special forces is that they break into smaller and smaller groups that can make their own decisions. So it's like, we're going to take that, go take that hill. They're not saying how, what to use, what, like that little group figures that out. And so that's kind of, we're like, we're going to, you know, do this. And every little group has to figure out what tools to use, what, and that's, by keeping it autonomous, you know, that allows you to, to definitely move faster as a newer team versus the sort of more formal structure of like the, the, the triangle where the CEO has the meetings with the, right. you know, executive team and then they keep pushing this stuff down because that just takes time cycles. And when you're literally growing as fast as we are, there's just, you don't have, that will slow you down. So, so I think, and again, that wasn't something I didn't, I didn't like think, I didn't think I was like mastering business management by setting it up like that. I'm lazy, I don't like managing people. So the people that stay around are the people that are great at, the team members that are great at doing this themselves and being upstart. The, the team members that don't, that come in and don't like that environment, there's people that hate our company. Like there's people that come in and literally, like this is the worst, like exit interview, like it's the worst place to work ever. There's like, you give no <laughs> feedback. There's no, I'm like, yeah, no we don't. Like, sorry. Like, but. But that's not our person. Like, there's no KPI. Like, like these KPIs is like this whole thing of like, you know, like, you know, oh, uh, you know, like I get two, two million of this, and like, we just don't do it. Our KPI is to stop as many burglars from robbing homes and neighborhoods in the world. Like that, that's our KPI. That's it. Because we have one KPI in the company, which is to make neighborhoods safer. Which is so great. And do it at scale as fast as we can. We have time for no matter what type of neighborhood two more. it is, too. It, that's yeah, the no, that's that's the for sure. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot for sharing your story. MBA 99 here. Cool. Um, hey, um, because it's a mission-driven company, and you're talking about that being your key um, indicator of success, how do you measure that? Because it's a, it's a very hard thing to, it's an easy thing to, it's easier to measure sales and growth right. and all those things. I mean, we have analytics for all that stuff. But when you're really impacting society, how do you measure that? And how do you track and... Uh, uh, attribute the, 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 those metrics are because of the sure. product that you put out there? So, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of ways we do it. We actually have, I mean, we do so much around that area of things. So almost once a day, there's an email sent out. We caught this person and here's what happened. And here's a story. So it's not about tracking it like as a KPI. It's not like saying we need to go from one of those a day to three. It's more about like, are we creating impact? And so just seeing like these things, like there's obvious, obvious impact from that. It goes into the product design side of things. So it's, it's and then you, we know if it's working, that, go, you know, that selling 39,000 units on QVC means that 39,000 new homes will have Ring, 
which means that we will be bringing that into neighborhoods and we you know and so so there is the numbers do for, like we're not we're not like allergic to having cash come in right. but we just don't focus on it and so it's it's just like 39,000 neighbors are going to be lit up with ring that means like those neighbors are going to get safer and we're going to you know so it, it's more around like kind of driving off of that and you do look at where those sales are oh, and look at where they're sure. not for and, sure. And, and strive to bring it to I, neighborhoods yeah. that either can't afford it or don't know about it, yeah. and then use the law enforcement. You've been doing that very yeah. effectively in LA. And I think the, the big difference between us and most companies, because everyone runs differently, but is that most companies would have an actual dollar goal at the end of the year. It's just we just don't, it, they just don't exist amongst the teams. Hi, Jamie. Thanks for sharing. Um, I was just wondering, in your specific case, when you went from having no money to having money, um, how did you decide where to spend that money? Like, there is this dilemma where do you spend it more in developing the product or going out for marketing? And how was it for you? How did you decide that? So, I mean, great, like, great question, especially, like, from the Silicon Valley side of where we're talking about raising money and people, like, people are burning out that, like, spent it. So. One is I try to spend money on things that I believe will be accretive to, to building value, value for the company. Um, so like tables in our conference room, not accretive to building value for the company. These chairs. Chairs, not going to be in the office. Not, a, not accretive. <laughs> like, like getting the roof fixed, put a, put a, put a tarp on it. Like it's fine. Um, you know, things that are accretive are things that are going to, to make value for our company. Engineers building new features, products, getting, you know, better manufacturers, like all, all of those things, you know, distribution. Um, so, but we never, we raised 209 million, but it was given to us in kind of overall pretty little chunks. So I was always kind of running out. So I've never been like, it's, it's like, I, I'd say it's like playing football. Like you're in the peewee leagues, you're playing other peewee players. And when you're in the high school, you're playing other high school players. You're in college, you're playing other, so you're always at like the kind of, like you never, like when you're in college, you're not playing Pee Wee. Like, so you don't have this like, and now I feel like we're in the NFL and we're the most underfunded team in the NFL. <laughs> and I just got sued by the Dallas Cowboys. So, but I'm still gonna win the Super Bowl. That's right. And so um, we've just, yeah, we've never really been, we're in a position now where we do have a lot of cash. Um, it is so easy and I've learned that it is so easy to get rid of money and so hard to get it back. And so we are just so careful about how we spend every single dollar. And again, that's been driven throughout the company now. It's in our ethos, it's in our bloodstream. It's like kind of in every, every part. Um. Thank you, Jamie. Thank Do you, you have any you. parting words? No, I just, you know, again, I'm looking Wish for the next. Wish me off the campus. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie's got a kid. <laughs> I think that was good for your character. Again, persistence, it was very good. It she was. She was a tad bit social. Um, Jamie's got a flight to catch, but I know he'll want to talk to a couple of you on the way out. Um, and we want him to get home to Oliver as, yes. as quickly as we can. But I'm looking out in the audience, and I'm trying to predict like who the next person is that 10 years or five years from now will be sitting on stage. And I, I'm pretty sure it'll be somebody in this room. So. The great thing is it's impossible to predict, because I yeah. can tell you everyone told me I had no chance. So, <laughs> so like, I mean, it is uh, the amount of no's that you get in yeah. life. And that's you what I mean, keep going. You, you, you have to because it, it is not, you know, it's, it's like the cool people are not the ones that end up, it's not what makes it in the end. It's, right. the, it's, the, it's the persistence. It's like the junkyard dogs a lot of time. It's yeah. like, and, you, and those people, I mean, like, you know, Richard Branson, total junkyard dog, you know, he's, he's fighting every day also yeah, still. I mean, and, and he's, you know, doesn't need to. No. So. Uh, but I, I will tell you this, for as successful as Jamie has been in the last few years and actually through his whole life, he is the same guy that roamed uh, the campus with a keg or many cases of beer um, on a Friday night. And, and he would, you know, he would still to love you. to do that. <laughs> if I let him back on campus, he, could, he yeah, would do that. Would. But he's, he's as humble and as, and as uh, down to earth as he was then. So again, I. Uh, I so and, it, and, that. and that's also because it can all go away. Right. Like you it's, it. it's, you, you have to remember it. that, like it's no matter what size you are, like this is, a, like there's always people. Like I said, like the Dallas Cowboys just we're in the NFL, but we just got sued by the Cowboys. Like it is, it is, uh, it is very fragile. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the, I will say that the people that I've met that are cocky, short term seem to do very well. Long term, 
I, I know a lot that have blown up massive fortunes. Um, and so I, I'd say one part is I'm humble. The second part is I think I also realize that this could be, this could be gone in 60 seconds. And so like that keeps me fighting and, and in it every day and realizing that I'm no, we're no different than anyone else. So. Thank you, honey. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Thank you, Carol. Thanks for joining our conversation. For additional events, tools, and articles, subscribe at thrive.freerange.com.